and as we remain happy about the work we've already done, I want to say to you, my name is Jim Anderson. I'm the president of Peace Action New York State, and I am indeed extremely happy to be with the Peace family from all around the world. If you just do allow me to do two quick things. One is I must invoke the name Akimi Kakuta. It's who I met in 2015 during the MPT. And then the th second thing I need to do in the room is have you make a little noise for me. So if you just repeat after me, no more Hiroshima's. No more Hiroshima's. No more Nagasaki's. No more Nagasaki. Move the bases from Okinawa. Move the bases from Okinawa. Thank you. Just a little gift, I need to hear that. Okay, let me say to you right now, the panel before you now is organizing for the nuclear disarmament, youth in the lead, and definitely in the lead. They are the here and now leaders. They are not the leaders of the future, the future is now. They are the bearers of the new energy, the new knowledge, and the new strength that we need to forge ahead. They are not the ocean of the movement, but they are a great wave on the ocean of movement. And they are serious. And we're about to find out that they can speak for themselves and plead their own case. And with that said, I will introduce our first panelist. Kate Alexander from Peace Action New York State is an advocate for peace in the halls of the UN and in the streets of New York City. As the policy director of Peace Action New York State, she supports the activism of student chapters and over 4,000 community activists throughout New York. And recently co mc the Peace Hub Rally of the Peace Climate March in DC. Her activism for peace is always informed by her field research in Bosnia and Uganda. Kate also serves as the Deputy Representative of the International Peace Bureau at the United Nations, where she has spoken against endless defense spending and militarization around the world. Kate Alexander. Thank you, Jim. My pleasure. <laughs> Um, so first of all, thank you to everyone in the room. Um, I want to bear a special thank you to you because oh how rare it is to be a young organizer and have an audience of this size. So thank you. <laughs> um, I have such the pleasure of working with uh, about 15 chapters now throughout New York State who are student organizers younger than my little sister and me. <laughs> who are deeply committed to international peace and security, knowing that the only security for our generation will come when we stop climate change and get rid of nuclear weapons. So I, I talk to our student organizers every week during the school year. And I want to come here not only as my, myself, but speaking from, for them and for some of the trends that I've heard coming back from them in terms of how students in the U.S. are getting involved. The first is so simple, um, and it's something that we've heard over and over, which is speak simply. Students in the U.S. are actively discouraged from learning about our issues. Teachers risk being fired if they talk about politics, even if that politics is our own muddled, horrible history of militarism, racism, and xenophobia. These conversations are not happening in our schools, which is why I appeal to you to speak to them in your home. And do not wait until they're 18 to tell them that their voice in politics matters, because that's the number one that we mistake that we're making as a society. By the time they're 18, they're actively encouraged to have already identified what college they are going to, to know their entire career path, 
which is absolutely something that's, I think, laughable to anyone over the age of 25 in this room. So speak simply, but because, and don't never tell someone who is young who you disagree with that you disagree with them because they don't understand. Because I don't know what poll every Democrat read that said if you tell people they're not showing up to the polls, they'll start showing up. That poll is wrong. That poll is just wrong. If you tell people they're not showing up, you're creating a self-fulfilling prophecy where you are enabling and allowing students to say, I don't have a voice in this process. I've been told I don't have a voice in this process, so I'm going to give up on it. Those same students are in the streets with so many movements acknowledging that the system is broken, but if they bring those conversations back on a one-on-one -on -one basis, they are so often told that they are idealistic or naive. But this week, the US Senate voted to allow an arms deal to Saudi Arabia. That armed, despite the fact that those arms are being used in Yemen against a population where 17 million people are at the risk of famine, and where there's now a cholera outbreak, and the UN has said repeatedly that the armed conflict is the cause. Calling a system broken that has chosen, that has cho chosen over and over and over again to bomb populations that have no health care, no food, is not only right and just and fair, it is informed and necessary, and that's all you need to know for the students out there who are saying that the system is broken. They are not uninformed, they are not naive, they are not too young to know, they know exactly, and they're able to call that out with the power of moral truth. Because some things just are simple. War is wrong, nuclear weapons are wrong, and quite frankly, I think it's naive after 16 years in Afghanistan to assume that war can work. That's what's naive. They've also asked to treat young people as humans. I know I've been in a lot of rooms where there has been age tokenization, where because you are young, you're asked to speak on behalf of all young people. And I know also that I, as a white woman, have probably experienced much less of this than many other people. Um, and that needs to be addressed. Because every young person comes to these battles from different backgrounds. We're, we are all came to this room not because we are young, but because of experiences in our lives that matter. And for you, to get us to continue coming back, it has to be acknowledged that yes, we have lived less life in a number of years than many other people, but what we have lived is all that we have. It's the things that matter most to us and they can't be pushed aside by anyone who we speak to in order to be, for us to be taken seriously or for you to assume that we're listening to you. Our experiences, even if our, not our years, are equals in every conversation that we have. And I, this is something that I, that I know I experience to this day. But it's also something that I haven't realized I've done to my own student organizers. And I didn't realize it until we had the student conference and there was a question posed by trainers with Amnesty International, which was, what made you get involved? What was your moment of political awakening? And my students, who were about 100 students in a room, created a timeline of when they were involved. Many of them have parents who are refugees. A few have parents who have been deported. A few have been stopped on playgrounds because they were, because they were black and they said as much in their notes. A few of them have had really good teachers who went out of their way to educate them about everything that's going wrong in this world and why they might be a target Knowing those experiences is important. You have to know who you're talking to is more than an age.
Which brings me to another point, which is that representation matters. I think it, um, I'm probably gonna paraphrase really badly here, but I think it was Maya Angelou who said, um, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. That same thing should be said of every organization because that is how students are approaching you. If they don't see that young people are involved, if they don't see that women are involved, if they don't see that people of different faith, sexual, ideological backgrounds are part of your movement, they don't see an organization that has made space for them or that has ever spoken to their issues. And that's on you, not on them. So the question here is how can we ask people to show up for us who we are not showing up for? So to that end, quick event plug. Um, Tuesday, if any of you are still here, is the Global Day of Action for Refugee Resettlement. At 8.30 p.m. at Dog Hammer School at Plaza by the UN, there is going to be an interfaith iftar, which is the meal um, to break fast every night after sunset during Ramadan. That's a public event, and I encourage all of you to be there. The fourth point is to ask us questions. And this is so, and to me, this is the point that drives the connections between our movements. We have to know each other, actually. Because earlier this week, I was talking to Ms. Kawazoe, um, Ahibakusha, um, and she uh, described to me and to other students who were at the UN with Peace Action the gust of wind that was created when the bomb went off. I had heard that same expression the night before from a girl who was in high school in Lebanon during the war. These experiences are universal and the people most affected by them walk among us but we'll never know who they are until we start breaking down whatever ridiculous social rule it was that said we can't talk politics and religion. Too bad. <laughs> and then there's one more point that I want to make to everyone in this room, which is provide structure, but get out of the way. <laughs> make it as easy as possible for students to get involved because they do want to be involved. I have heard more calls for the abolition of nuclear weapons from my students this past year than I have from even our international allies. And that is a turn that has been absolutely caused by the new immediacy of this administration. But if you don't have a way to plug in those people who are show interest now in this moment, with whatever background they have, with whatever knowledge is missing, whatever tools they have, in whatever community they come from, what are you doing? <laughs> We have to provide structure, be it, um, be it postcards to representatives, or fact sheets, or petitions, or conferences like this one, or meetings with our representatives, or trips to meet other students, or other ways to network online in peaceful communities with one another. Provide that structure, but get the heck out of the way, because students know where they're going. For us in the US, we, most of us have never known an economy that wasn't crippled by war. Today, this is what my students and I are talking about, that we're spending the cost of nuclear weapons modernization recently up to $1.2 trillion. And when you talk about dividing the movements, let's talk about that with our money. Because with $1.2 trillion, we could fully fund the US commitment to the Paris climate deal. 400 times. <laughs> or we could fund it once and also fund the gap in addressing the global refugee crisis. We could stop collecting interest on student loan repayments. We could double federal spending on education, provide every household in the US with solar electricity for a year, create four million clean energy jobs, and 
provide 15 million university students with four-year full-ride scholarships to public universities. This is what students want, this is what they're in the streets demanding, and we need to be there with them. Thank you. Well, the spirit of fire is already in our ranks, that's for sure. Our next speaker, Masan Nusan, is from Kazakhstan. She is with the PNND. She is the coordinator for CIS Countries and Abolition 2000 Youth Working Group. Ms. Nassan from Kazakhstan serves as PNND coordinator for the Commonwealth of Independent States, former Soviet countries, and represents Abolition 2000 Youth Working Group as interim convener. Having experience of being engaged in youth activities connected with peace and conflict resolution, this is a part-time position while she completes her master's in social sciences in Germany. Ms. Nusan has work experience in Pakistan offices of several diplomatic and international institutions, including the U.S. Consulate, Department of Public Affairs, UNDI, and the United Nations Women and UNHCR. Welcome to the podium, Ms. Nissan. Thank you. So good afternoon everyone, uh, my name is Marjan and I'm from Kazakhstan, uh, just to make sure that everybody heard. Uh, so I would like first of all to thank you for this opportunity to speak here, uh, special thanks to Joseph and Alan for uh, proposing me to speak here. So dear friends here, I'm speaking on behalf of, uh, as was mentioned before, PNND, which is Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament. I'm also interim convener of Abolition 2000 Youth Working Group. Uh, and most of all, I am a representative from Kazakhstan, uh, from my home country. So first of all, I would like to start uh, with the personal motivation to join this nuclear disarmament. Uh, I'm coming from a country which is um, um, a place which was hosting 500 nuclear tests during the USSR time. During 40 years, starting from 1949 till 1989, hosting 500 nuclear tests which are having capacity of 2,500 Hiroshima's atomic bombs. And um, I would like also to mention that uh, the people who were in this nuclear test site, which is Semipalatin's nuclear test site, located in the eastern part of Kazakhstan, um, two million people were affected by the radiation, by the horrific humanitarian impact from the nuclear tests. So those people are still suffering and still having health issues, uh, they are being affected by the cancer and having birth deformations and simply trying to make their lives uh, facing those difficulties. And I'm standing here today to represent them. And I would like to um, emphasize that there are not only Hibakushas, there are not only um, indigenous people, but there are also people who are the victims from Kazakhstan. And I also would like uh, everyone to know about it because most of the time Kazakhstan is not mentioned or many people don't know about it So at the end I would like, like to say that we are all human beings So we are all against nuclear weapons here So we shouldn't be really dividing but working together towards the nuclear disarmament um, I also would like to mention that um, The nuclear test site which was existing in Kazakhstan during the USSR time uh, it was closed thanks to the international uh, anti-nuclear movement, which was called Nevada Semipalatins, which stands for Nevada Nuclear Test Site and Semipalatins Nuclear Test Site in Kazakhstan. So this was the shining example of how uh, civil society could be very strong and put joint global efforts to bring the international attention to the existing problem of humanitarian and environmental aspects of the existing nuclear test site. And actually, they were so much successful that this resulted in the closure of the semi nuclear test site. Um, so next of all, I would like to uh, say a couple of words as on behalf of speaking uh, as a coordinator of CIS countries, which stands for post-Soviet 
uh, union countries uh, to which Kazakhstan also belongs. Um, so uh, as part of being um, PNND, but I'm also a young person. So thanks to the PNND, uh, I have had a lot of experiences in nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. So I would like to mention a couple of them which were really important for me and where I could get uh, some experience but also make a contribution and to feel that I'm really useful uh, and that I'm really making a change. So um, last year um, uh, we were organizing an international conference, um, Building Nuclear Weapon Free World, which was uh, commemorating the 25th anniversary of the closure of Timmy Palacin's uh, nuclear test site. Uh, and this was the conference which was uh, uniting people from different backgrounds. Take the um, diplomats, lawyers, religious uh, leaders, um, also students. So there were academics, uh, scientists, there were, so there were a lot of people coming from the different backgrounds but fighting for the same goal. Uh, next, uh, I would like to uh, say about the ATOM project, which is the international campaign. The ATOM stands for the Abolishing Test is our mission, the acronym for ATOM. It's an international campaign which was launched during the PNND Assembly, and this campaign comes from Kazakhstan. There is uh, actually a website, and in this website you can see the petition, which is um, calling people to sign petition uh, for nuclear disarmament and against uh, nuclear weapons to abolish, to actually get rid of nuclear weapons. So the uh, purpose of this website is not only to, um, to talk about the humanitarian aspects, but also to go the, beyond those humanitarian aspects, saying that nuclear weapons are really posing danger. So now you can see the example of those peoples because there are some videos of the um, victims, so you can really see it your, by your eyes. So at the moment there are 300,000 uh, signatures uh, collected, but the aim is to reach one million people. I see, <laughs> thank you. So I would like to, everyone, uh, if you have a chance, because we are all of us using social media and we are living in a century of technologies and I think it would be very nice if uh, everyone could just log in and sign the petition if you agree with that. Um, and uh, my last point, since the time is lacking, uh, I would like to mention about the Abolition 2000 Youth Working Group, uh, which was established several years ago, but it started to revive now. Uh, so the Abolition 2000 Youth Working Group is standing for the uh, young people uh, from all over the world to work together, to engage uh, in the field of nuclear disarmament, to have no boundaries, no um, limits, just to, to get together to provide a platform where uh, every young person could come and uh, do something, take some actions. So, um, yes. <laughs> so I just would like to say what Abolition 2000 is actually. So it's a global network which, in a, which unites um, um, different organizations from 90 countries. So it's uh, up to 2,000 organizations and their mission is to abolish nuclear weapons. So actually Youth Working Group stands for um, creating this bridge between the Abolition 2000 uh, actions and initiatives and those initi initiatives which could be proposed by the youth working group so that young people's voices could be heard and they could work together in cooperation because um, you as uh, older people, I mean, and young people, they could cooperate in, in the terms that uh, older generation could be like mentors and they can provide expertise, knowledge uh, and experience and transfer them to, to young people so that they can be more aware and uh, more technical, more <laughs> skilled, let's say, and more knowledgeable about the situation. So uh, I think uh, I'm going to be finishing, but I just would like to make one uh, announcement that tomorrow in the United Nations I will be chairing uh, Abolition 2000 Youth Working Group event, which will be during the morning time from 10 till 12.30 uh, at the conference room B. So I would like to uh, encourage young people to come to this event. I'm sorry that it's, it's just for young people, so it's more peer-to-peer -peer education. Uh, and if you have UN pass, you are more than welcome to come. Thank you, and I'm sorry for taking more time. It was fine. The, t the time is yours because the world will soon be long to all of you. Anyway, and would you believe that at first she thought she would not need all the time? Mm -hmm. They have a lot to say. Our third speaker will be, now I'm about to mess up a name, but she's going to straighten me out, right? <laughs> Taki 
Hi Ranaka. Yes. Hi Ranaka. Okay, yes. Oh, let me let me read. I didn't finish saying more than I wanted to say about her. Haranaka Ta Haranataki is a third generation of the Habakasha, born in 1985 since she was a high school student. She has taken part in the World Conference every year and engaged in activities to listen to and record the Habakasha's testimonies. She took part in the International Action of 2005 MPT Review Conference when she was a university student. After graduating from the university, she had worked at Hiroshima Medical Co-op until 2015. Now she is actively engaged in peace and youth movements as a full-time activist and a head of the Hiroshima Prefectural Democratic Youth League. Hiranaka Taki? Taki. 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 Takai. I'll get it eventually. Welcome to the podium, Takai.広島から来ました。広中です。核兵器禁止条約の実現が目の前に来ていることにワクワクしています。今回提案されている条約草案が被爆者の苦しみの上に立っていることとても感動しています。この条約を作る原動力は被爆者の方々の自分たちが生きているうちに核兵器をなくしたいそういう通説な願いですそして日本だけでなく世界の人々の声と行動でここまで条約が条約の議論が進みましたこれまで行ってきた署名行動被爆証言の継承活動原爆写真展などの取り組
He works as determination to refuse retaliation, but abolition of nuclear weapons and wars, the root cause of the suffering, would light up the heart of young people. We are working to hold events across the country to listen to Hibakusha testimonies. Young participants, after hearing Hibakusha's stories for the first time, will often come out, at, often come out to express their commitment to join a Hibakusha in a struggle against nuclear weapons. Secondly, in addition to listening to the Hibakusha's testimonies, we make sure young people have the opportunity to learn the history and achievement of the nuclear abolition movement and the significance of the treaty now discussed to ban nuclear weapons. By knowing about them, they feel confident in stepping out on the street to join the signature drive. Here are some voices and commitment of young people who learn about the UN conference to negotiate a treaty to ban nuclear weapons held last March. I want to work as part of the grassroots acti activities that is what the young person said. The abolition of nuclear weapons has literally become the global current, or this treaty will be important to dispel the threat from other countries or the threat of nuclear proliferation. These are the words of the young people. In soli soliciting signatures on the street, it takes certain courage to address passers-by, and it also takes courage for you to append your own signature on the petition. But I believe that the courage of each one of us accumulated has moved the international community to come close to creating a treaty that would stigmatize nuclear weapons as evil. In collecting signatures, we often invite people to fold paper cranes together and talk casually about peace. This is called paper crane campaign. In June, I met a couple who came to Hiroshima for a concert. They said, we have just come out of the Peace Memorial Museum. We almost cried to see the damage caused by a nuclear weapon and signed our petition. I realized that through this Hibakusha Appeal International Signature Campaign, we can reach out to young people to work together to achieve a world without nuclear weapons. We also see some people just ignoring us or saying out of their concern over nuclear threat from other countries. We may need to possess nuclear weapons as deterrence, they would say. But when we ask them if they support or oppose nuclear weapons and share their thoughts, we come to know they want to get rid of both nuclear weapons and wars. To those who are worried about nuclear threat, we should explain about the discussion going on over a treaty to ban nuclear weapons or international public opinion and show them a prospect that nuclear weapons can be abolished. The government of Japan has already declared that it would not take part in the negotiations on the ban treaty. A student who heard about this got angry and said, how can Japan take such an ambiguous attitude over nuclear weapons? Japan should be the one to take the lead in joining and supporting the treaty. In order to change the government, which betrays the aspiration of the youth, we must develop our activities from grassroots, involving young people who are joining signature campaign, share their hope for nuclear weapons abolition, and stand up for actions together. I am confident that if young people uphold their demands as sovereign power of the nation and step out into action, we can change politics of our country. 最後になりますが、この国連会議で核兵器禁止条約が採択されれば、今度は各国政府に批准条約批准を求める運動が始まります。その時に核兵器を頂点とした軍事同盟を結んでいる日米両国の青年の連帯が核兵器のない世界の未
成果を共有し合うために、8月には広島と長崎で、世界の若い皆さんとお会いできることを願って、私からの発言とします。ご清聴ありがとうございました。Last, last but not least, if a convention to prohibit nuclear weapons is adopted in a UN conference, our next work will be to urge national governments to ratify the treaty. The solidarity between the young peoples of the United States and Japan, which are in a military and nuclear alliance, should play a significant role in opening the future of a world without nuclear weapons. For co consolidating our movement, I, I call on you to join, join us in a world conference against atomic and hydrogen bombs to be held in August in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We will have young people's caucus meetings where we can share many of our experiences and campaigns carried out not only in Japan but all over the world. Let us meet again in Hiroshima and Nagasaki coming August. Thank you for your listening. Yeah. Can you imagine her voice on the floor of any legislative body throughout the world? <laughs> Can you imagine that strength, that power? This is our youth, y'all. This is our youth. They represent and they bring it. Our fourth and final speaker will be Uday Singh of Amplify Youth Network for Nuclear Abolition. Uday is a lawyer based in India and currently practicing at the Supreme Court of India in Delhi. High Court, Indian Court of Appeals. After being introduced to the issue during his teenage years, he has worked on many projects related to nuclear disarmament, often contributing his skills and knowledge in law. He assisted the Marshall Islands case through Baso Peace Office. Welcome to the podium, Uday Singh. Thank you.、Uh, it was surprising to see that my name was pronounced perfect. So, yes, <laughs> good afternoon.、Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you. It's rather hot, and everyone's been really patient. So, I'll try to keep it short.、Uh, I'm Uday Singh. I'm here representing Amplify, Generation of Change.、Uh, today's youth is disgusted. It's disgusted with today's politics, education, and social atmosphere. We are facing a problem. We are facing a problem of not being heard. And if we are heard, we are not being taken seriously. But to, youth, youth's energy need not and should not be discouraged. Rather, it should be put to constructive purpose. That's what we did two years back. Amplify Generation of Change, an international network, was born two years ago at the International Youth Summit for Nuclear Abolition held in Hiroshima, Japan. From 28 to the 30th of 2015, marking also the 70th anniversary at the of the atomic bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The International Youth Summit gave the next generation of nuclear disarmament leaders the opportunity to experience firsthand the atrocities that took place 70 years ago and to commit to abolish these horrific、uh, weapons of mass destruction. Additionally, the event helped preserve the living memories of the Hibakusha. And further inspired youth to ensure the world is free from nuclear weapons. The final day of the summit was a public forum、uh, where participants deepened their understanding of the issue, discussed what actions they need to take when they go back to their communities, to their countries, and heard and connected with the UN Secretary General's envoy on youth. Based on the successful completion of the、uh, International Youth Summit for、uh, Nuclear Abolition, Uh, and seeing the needs and the desires of the participants to continue to channelize this young energy for a shared goal of nuclear abolition, Amplify Generation of Change was born. Amplify supports and aims to unite young people from all across the globe and encourage young people's involvements, activities, and actions for nuclear abolition. The network also aims to empower young people. Who are new to this cause by providing information and resources to learn about the issues and to connect with other youth taking action. In the past two years, the steering committee and the members of Amplify 
have presented the youth pledge calling for nuclear abolition in various countries such as the United States, Serbia, India and the United Kingdom. Here I'd like to take recourse to one of the great quotes of Mahatma Gandhi on the importance and the role of youth. Youth are the life of the nation. They must be ready to discharge responsibility as it prepares them to become mature and worthy. They are needed always. Even as we marched yesterday at the Women's mar uh, March from Bryant Park, it was amazing to see how beautiful youth from all across the world marched ahead, walked ahead, shouting slogans in the thick of the rain. Even the thick of the rain could not shower or shower away their zest for nuclear abolition. Uh, young people today are receptive to change and having a large stake and have a large stake in creating a, a, the future youth involvement facilitates positive social change including structures policies and procedures that are demand driven even president obama's speech back in the day in the year 2009 emphasized the importance of youth as he stated if the goal of a nuclear weapons free world is to be pursued one has to acknowledge the importance of youth the shoulders which are going to bear the responsibility for the future and who will make sure that the quest continues until the goal of global zero is achieved. As Kate, my friend, my new friend, uh, newfound friend Kate mentioned, it is also important to understand, uh, and here I'll take the example that why youth must not be shunned away with or to be told that you can't do it or you're too young to understand it because it might take some time to understand but I guess the vision is very clear uh, here is a bit of a negative example as to an area where the growth of, of this issue is becoming more and more endangered that being South Asia this is due to the uh, non-participation and uh, the misinformation uh, to the youth the need for involvement of youth in, the, in nuclear discourse is being actually acutely felt as the campaign is hardly growing, there is a paucity of institutions, both government backed and private, which can educate the masses, especially the students, and develop the capacity among the youth in order to understand the nuances of nuclear weapons and the issue of disarmament. Uh, without an independent and matured understanding of this issue, critical reflection on the need and the viability of nuclear weapons has become a casualty. The incapacity of the youth to question nuclear, uh, nuclearization appears to constitute nothing less than a conspiracy to sustain the discourse of nuclear brinksmanship. Keeping the above in mind, it is very clear that for a sense of empowerment, purposeful engagement, inclusiveness, youth must be at the center of participation. Having said that, youth has played an important role in campaigns all across the world. Um, be it civil disobedience movement or the Berlin Wall. So we, the youth at Amplify, are determined to achieve the world, a world without nuclear weapons. We are 16 participants as of today from 20 countries here on the occasion of the United Nations Conference to negotiate a legally binding instrument to, pro uh, to prohibit nuclear weapons, to deliver a powerful statement, to participate at the Women's March, to show that the youth has the power, energy, and the zest to ban nuclear weapons. Thank you. I want to thank all our panelists. And what I want to say to you now, we will entertain possibly three, hopefully two questions, and it because of the essence of time. So if there is anyone who would like to ask a question of our panelists, now is the time to raise your hand and uh, we can get that question asked. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for inspiring us today with um, your talks. Um, several of you mentioned how important it is to get uh, youth um, engaged and to um, open up ways to, to uh, and structures to get youth engaged and to hear their voices. Um, I'm actually also interested to hear how you think um, that 
different generations can actually cooperate um, because I think the youth also has a lot to learn from other generations and there's a lot we can take on from them and how can we actually open that up and make it a two-way street so that both generations can fully benefit from what the other has to bring to the table thank you any anyone or all oh. Oh. Well, start. Oh. Um, why don't we do the other way? Where's the mic? Okay. <laughs> we can still go ahead. Go, go ahead and talk. Okay. Go ahead. We'll just, like, rotate. Why don't you join around okay. the mic, all of you? Yeah. Okay. There you go. You got it? Yep. Okay. Cool. Um, Speak right into it, please. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> okay. So, um, I'm probably going to be really unpopular in answering this question because I think, I think the problem is that it's always a one-way street that it's always the youth, you have so much to learn from this other generation. Learning from their elders, if their elders treated them like people who had something to teach themselves. Um, I know that in my own activism career, perhaps the most important part of it has been mentorship and having those kind of very open relationships, people who've been in advocacy for a long time. But those relationships started when like one person from um, the organization Jubilee USA, which works on debt relief, uh, asked, <laughs> asked, someone, asked a group of us when I was in college, would any of you like to take on this event? And I was immediately plugged into a leadership role. Um, and I think that acknowledging that A, young people have skills to bring to the table even before you know them and before they prove that to you, and B, asking questions, and C, showing up where they are and asking them to get involved will open those relationships in ways where the learning is much more natural and much more intergenerational. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, so to reply to this question, as I have mentioned before in my speech, I already said about mentorship and Kate repeated it, so I don't want to be repeating this stuff. Uh, but I would like to say that there is a great example of uh, Abolition 2000 Youth Working Group. So this is the place where older generation meets younger generation. And actually this is the place of exchange of um, ideas, knowledge, expertise, skills. So I think it's a great example to say and to encourage everybody to join and try to make this intergenerational cooperation to actually really work. Yeah, thank you. Well, my answer is going to be a little nice and light. If it was not for a lot of our elders sitting here today, we would not be encouraged to be speaking right now. So I guess a lot of the encouragement that at least I've got, uh, whether when I was working with ICANN or PNND or now with Amplify, comes from uh, the more experienced and the uh, our elders who have helped us. I have a few joining me here, in fact. Uh, Ariel is there from ICANN. One of uh, the major reasons why I stuck to ICANN, uh, one of the major reasons why I am standing here participating or am a part of Amplify is because of my mentor who's an elder to me, uh, Mr. Alan Ware. So I guess the great sense of encouragement that the youth, uh, youth derives that from their elders a very small close section who I would say would be discouraging and say that the youth uh, does not know much but of course people who be the part of a campaign whether nuclear abolition or climate change uh, there's a lot to be learned from them and uh, I also come from the Indian culture where you always say listen to your elders so yes I think that really matters <laughs>異なる年代が力を合わせるその時にどんなやりとりが必要かということで言えば日本では今若い人やベテラン世代がお互いをリスペクトし合うそういう取り組みを進めています相手お互いが若い世代は年配の方の話を聞くし年配の方は若い世代
how the different generations uh, come together. Uh, one of the things I want to say is in Japan, uh, right now, young people and elderly or, or more experienced people are trying to uh, respect with each other. And this, uh, and this is the, the, I think this is the, maybe the best way uh, to have different generations come together. So young, young generation respect uh, those with more experiences and those with more experiences and respect young people. And this is how we can start the, our conversation and, and coming together. I say that mentorship is important, I fully agree with that, but at the same time I would like to say that as a young person from my perspective, peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, education and training seminars are more productive and more efficient, I would say, because when we are, let's say, having this mentorship program, it's all about sharing the knowledge and bringing us expertise and etc. and giving us directions, but as Kate said before, like. Uh, step out, we need to do it ourselves, so you should be leading as like the panel says. So this is, I think, the, the voice that, from young people, yeah, that share with me. Thank you. The final question uh, is written, and it is uh, for you all. Would you youth be available to speak at area colleges? And I'll ask you to answer by raising your hand so that people can see who they need to contact after you leave this panel. Uh, can you translate? Yes. <laughs> Want to know if they would be available and interested in speaking at colleges? In, in, in New York, I presume, or Interest anywhere, wherever, if there, would you be interested in speaking at a college? Maybe we should just say like where we're based. Okay, wherever they're based, I would say yes. Yeah. And I would ask the young panelists, if you just stand, and I would ask the audience, take a look at the future of the movement. Please stand. Thank you.